So I've divided it to basically three. Uh, one is supply chain integration. The uh, food supply chains, as we know, are for every food, there's a different supply chain. Uh, they're very complicated. Uh, but I think there are, because of historical reasons, some opportunities here for us with our sets of skills, which tend to be quantitative, um, particularly with this increase in traceability and pre predictive modeling. And so I'll say a little bit about that. Um, I think there's a lot to be done here in simply um, understanding international logistics practice and its implications for the transport of food. We've done some of this here with the Wine Supply Chain Council. And the third topic, which I won't say very much about because I don't know very much about it, but um, Ricardo Mancini is the one who first really alerted me to this when we enjoyed the meeting, our most recent meeting, in Bologna. Um, slow food, local food, and the supply chains are increasingly based on mobile communications. Uh, since being sensitized to this, I've suddenly become aware just in um, my own region of this organization, for example, of farmers who, who are very supportive of local produce and, and slow, careful preparation, organizing their own uh, almost parallel supply chain to parallel those of the big industrial. Come in, come in. Welcome. So that there are um, farmers markets, for example, or distribution systems that are entirely organized by Twitter. Um, and this is a relatively recent phenomenon. And so I, I think there's some, maybe they, they, it bears looking at. Uh, at least this is a recent phenomenon in the United States, I should say. Um, welcome, uh, recent arrivals. I'm John Bartholdi, the first speaker. Um, and you, I think you just were welcomed by Sergio, who is the conference organizer. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about um, the integration of supply chains. Of course, this is the problem that for every perishable product, um, from the point of view of the retailer, what they want to do is maximize this, the quality sell time. This is the time in which the uh, customer has at home to, um, to consume the product. Uh, there are many ways of max working on maximizing the quality sell time. One is to increase the entire life of the product, which you might do by genetic modification or clever packaging. Uh, those are all things that I don't think any of us are directly involved in. We tend to focus on this part, time to retail. If we can get the product there faster and in better condition, then we reduce the time to retail. That leaves more quality sell time. Uh, one very interesting economic driver that I would love to know is the value of an additional day of selling time. My experience is the retailers guard this information very carefully because if it were public, they would really be at the mercy of people like packagers and so forth who would really know the kind of power they have. Uh, I'm not sure I, I, they protect what information they have, but I'm not sure they even keep very good information. I know um, I've been pushing uh, Whole Foods, a major grocery chain in the United States, about this issue, and they say that they have, for all of their perishable product, a goal of not losing more than 7% of it while it's in the store. But that 7%, uh, first of all, when I ask individuals who manage the grocery section, for example, the, the fresh fruits and vegetables section, some of them think it's 7% by value, some of them think it's 7% by count, uh, and so, even the execution of Whole Foods is not very consistent. Um, and then there's the issue of the fact that 7% applies whether we're talking about uh, citrus fruits or strawberries, which have very different shelf lives. So, uh, you could, what this tells me is that this, this is just not managed very well, even at, um, 
large and sophisticated grocers that uh, you would think would be on top of this. So there's a lack of information about, about this period of time, a lack of information about the, uh, uh, it, it, it tends to be uh, devoted to treating large classes of product as if they were identical, when they're clearly not. Now, this makes sense in an era when people didn't have computers. So you might manage all your citrus fruits the same way and manage all your stone fruits another way. Uh, but in the area of computers, you can manage at the level of the specific product. And I would not be surprised if 20 years from now, we were managing the level of the individual piece of fruit. There's no technical reason why you can't do that. OK, so here's some of the facts that illustrate the need to integrate supply chains. Um, we focus on the logistics, and that's a significant amount of the cost. And it's a part that I think we can extract much more easily than um, you can generate savings, say, by genetic modification and things like that. Those are Nobody is opposed to reducing logistics costs. So it's a simpler thing to do. Um, there's just a terrible mismatch in this flow of, of consumables to, to people. Um, I don't know how much of this 25%, um, you can read all kinds of numbers here. Um, this is just the most recent one that I, I quoted. But the, um, some large portion of this is in the logistics. But it's a challenge because the, the logistics requirements for each type of product is so different. Um, some fruit is fragile and others is not. Some, uh, you know, the ripening is influenced by its immediate environment very strongly and others not so much. All of this is made harder by the fact that there are many participants in the supply chain and the product changes even as it's moving through the supply chain. So these are all challenges that I think create research opportunities. For example, strawberries. You can see in this progress from the farm here to the home that there are um, many different players, many different processes, many different issues. Um, and every one of these transitions from one state to the next state is an opportunity for abuse, or for oversight, for um, sometimes just very simple things that will, can easily lose a day of quality cell time. So in order to manage this, people have devised process models. In fact, here's four that I could think of quite easily without um, thinking very hard about it. And every one of these is different. So for example, the HACCP uh, in the United States focuses on critical control points, but it's primarily organized towards food safety. We want to make sure we're not poisoning everybody. Uh, more uh, along the lines of, of what many of us are trained to do, uh, here's the Lean Six Sigma it focuses on efficient use of resources and getting high value to the customer, but it says nothing about critical control points. Temperature planning and control focuses up just on one and probably the most important of those uh, external factors that influence the quality of the product as we move it to the customer. And then what's um, becoming more of an issue, uh, at least in the United States, is this idea of traceability. So all of these are, are different process models. And so I suggest that one valuable area of research would be to have some sort of unified process model, some way of looking at the movement of food to the customer in a way that integrates many of these issues, safety, quality, efficiency, and traceability. That does not exist now. No. We need an integrated model. So um, one way to begin, I think, is by process modeling. At Georgia Tech, we've tried to do some of this, and it's been very educational for us. Uh, this is, is the process model of how yucca uh, gets from 
the farm in Costa Rica to the retailer. So this is uh, all within Costa Rica. And what we did was just follow a route of yucca through every single process and try to document everything about how it was treated, what happened to it, how it was packaged, who did what. And amazingly, no, maybe not so amazingly, no single person has got an understanding of how all this works. If you ask the people along the supply chain, what they tend to do is they know from whom they received it, uh, then they process it, and they know to whom they ship it. But nobody has sort of oversight. Of course, this is one of the wonders of, of uh, economics, the fact that we can these supply chains sort of form and uh, get product all the way to customers without anybody knowing the whole, uh, the big <coughs> view. But this is an opportunity for us, I think, is to generate the big view and then be able to take this sort of supply chain perspective. Uh, the first thing that we noticed here in the Yucca project, and uh, I think holds more generally, is the how we can increase the value of the supply chain simply by sharing more information. So for example, I mean, one of the things that seems to us uh, missing is product labeling. There's inadequate product labeling. There's so much more useful information if we could include as a, some sort of industry standard, things like the uh, date and location of the harvest, and even having some standard product designation. At the moment, there's no kind of standard like that. For, and I'm thinking primarily here of international. <coughs> international trade. That is the <coughs> least formalized. Uh, some trading regions have developed uh, <coughs> first steps towards this kind of standardization, but for international trade there is not. Um, it, what's missing here are the things that enable us to take this supply chain perspective and focus on aligning the, um, the, our inventory strategies and the, building the network. So this sort of thing, simply, Whole Foods does not do this. They don't document actual shelf life. They just take this very general point of view, focusing on that 7%. Uh, and they don't share that information. OK, so here is uh, an opportunity. And I, this is a, a US-centric point of view. But in the last, uh, about two years ago, the U.S. passed the uh, Food Safety Modernization Act. And I think we're way behind Europe in this, but we are requiring now when somebody in the food chain uh, receives product that they record and keep available here, the product lot number date and who shipped it to them. And when they send it downstream, they have to record the same information and who received it. Now, of course, they may have reorganized the product, repackaged the product in some way. Uh, but then we, it may have created a new lot number, uh, for example. Uh, so it can be a slightly different product rearranged going downstream. But it knows, because it knows who received it, it knows who they received from, it's possible to reconstruct the network. And that's the idea here, is that this can be reconstructed for anything. If you have a shipment of fish, for example, and it's determined that something has gone wrong, and the food is potentially dangerous, then you can go to the retailer and ask, who shipped it to you? You can then contact the distributor and ask, who processed this? And you can move back up the supply chain. So this is required by law. Um, and there are certain time constraints on it, but they're quite generous time constraints. <coughs> well, what's going to happen, since this is by law, this is going to happen eventually uh, in the United States. And uh, this is going to, these requirements will be extended outside the borders of the United States. So that, for example, when we order that, those beautiful Chilean grapes in the middle of our winter, uh, we've still got to be able to, to come back all the way to the processor, packer, and producer here in Chile. Um, but it's going to take time. Now, here's where technology is on our side, because eventually this will happen very quickly. At the moment, it's not required to happen 
terribly fast. And in fact, you can satisfy the requirements of this law by simply having paper records on site so that you can look up and determine the view of filing cabinet. But of course, we know what's going to happen with technology. Eventually, all of this will be very quickly available. Perhaps that information will be recorded in a cloud someplace. Okay. Now, this changes the game and creates some opportunities for all of us, I think. Because if traceability becomes nearly instantaneous, the history of the product is always available in any intermediate state. So for example, if I have, if I'm processing fish here, because traceability is very fast, I can know everything that's happened to this fish. I can know who caught it, who packed it, I'm in the middle of processing it. I can, and in fact, in principle, I can know its history. I can know exactly where it was caught, what was the temperature of the ocean at the time. Since technology is so inexpensive, once it's set up here, it's very cheap to add more information. Eventually, we will know, for this piece of fish, its entire history. And now, we can use that to protect the future. We can do predictive modeling. So traceability is starting out primarily just as a way of slowly working back is going to become, in the next 10 years, 20 years maybe, is going to become a way of having complete information about the product. So we, can, we have this information. How can we use this to predict quality? Um, and what we're equipped to do, partly because we know each other, it's a way of leveraging our friendships, because um, we certainly have this experience working on the wine supply chain, where people know their region very well. They know, um, you know the Sergio knows all of the wine producers here, uh, as does Alejandro in, in Chile. But we in the United States may have better knowledge of the market there. And when we work together, we bring something that no single participant in the wine supply chain has. So we've been able to, to leverage this and I'll